very good morning and i especially thank the organizers <coughs> for giving us the opportunity of this presentation first of all i'll make the presentation and earlier we had given the feedback country feedback rather i should say uh, to rita that what india requires and what are the gray areas and green green areas so yeah so i'll be quite brief in my presentation so this is basically the structure of my presentation these are the areas i'll be covering and so first of all i'll be uh, speaking about the strategy that is benefits and targets in the in indian context so the, our focus is on uh, transdisciplinary edu uh, participation education and knowledge base co coordination and preparing Okay. Sure. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Preparing the uh, regulatory guidelines and creating the infrastructure in the genomic uh, area, gen genomic medicine area. Now, actually, the here actually I highlight the areas likely to be benefited: the diseases, the predictions, how it is going to benefit, and the diagnostics. and how increased knowledge is going to benefit us now here actually before i embark on this slide actually i would like to mention that from india there are four major funding agencies one is the department of biotechnology from where i belong and another is department of science and technology another is department of health research which comes under ministry of health and family welfare and another is council of scientific and industrial research that is again under snt ministry so in this particular slide i mentioned about the dbt institutions and particularly here i would like to highlight the nibmg and bmgc in the eastern part of our country actually this institution was established by the department it has uh, about uh, 50 million US dollar budget for the initial period of 5 years and it has a clinical attachment called biomedical genomic center in a clinical setup in calcutta so nibmg is located in kalyani and the, its clinical wing is in calcutta so both are functional at this point of time and in the next pre uh, subsequent presentation professor partha will address what is doing in nibmg so <laughs> therefore i am not elaborating on this and here i'd like to mention in the top of the uh, area the rcb that is regional center for biotechnology yesterday i did mention that is unesco category 2 center which has focus on education training and research and there is also an institution called translational health science and technology institute and also you can see nbrc that is national brain research center so there is a cluster uh, there and also the national institute of immunology so they are all engaged in biomedical area and uh, recently we have em embarked on a uh, interinstitutional program on preterm birth yeah, um, so uh, because india's burden is quite heavy it's almost annually 3.5 million and there are other institutions down south the and also western part of our country that that is national center for cell science and national institute of animal biotechnology center for dna uh, fingerprinting and diagnostics and instem and that uh, lowest one and the down more south is that is rgcb trivandrum regional uh, rajiv gandhi center for biotechnology now in gen uh, genetic cataloging of ethnic groups uh, that these are the important areas actually uh, uh, data coordination uh, which in uh, which will include the clinical data molecular involvement of molecular genes geneticists and anthropologists so creation of baseline data on various ethnic groups for disease susceptibility is very important that's what we consider and uh, what are the actually uh, our emphasis is on promoting translational research 
and the, that is towards diagnostic kits and uh, then vaccine development using reverse genetics then molecular tool for surveillance and uh, and these are the some of the examples wh what we have been doing now in the prenatal care area uh, we uh, this is also our focus and here actually uh, on the third point we have mentioned initiating that is the, uh, what i mentioned on preterm birth and we have genetic cl clinics at uh, different clinical setups for screening the doing the prenatal, uh, prenatal diagnosis now in cancer genomics uh, uh, and epigenomics of in genomics and epigenomics of cancer then uh, transc um, uh, transcriptomics of cancer and uh, nibmg is a part of international cancer genome consortium and india's uh, part is oral cancer, which Professor Partha will be highlighting. Now, other areas, these are the areas which we want to uh, highlight. And here, actually, uh, we are interested in harmonization uh, with international ethical guidelines. We have a national bioethics committee, and there the department is the nodal agency. Now, what are the hurdles? Now, these are the hurdles. Handling of large data set, evidence for health uh, treatments are based on research goals, research waste due to lack of expertise, lack of regulatory guidelines, incidental findings uh, major, ma, ma, majorly, and lack of knowledge in primary healthcare providers. So we need better technologies, large data set for patients, and lack of translational or interpretation. And last not the least, the funding and political will. Now what are the possible collaboration, collaborative areas? So one comes strengthening guidelines for implementation and preclinical and clinical trials. This is number one. Number two is use of traditional knowledge and integration into mo modern genetics. Next one is cloud sourcing, cloud sourcing for translation of genetic data. Next is development of new methods of disease classification based on recently discovered genetic principles. Next one is building community interest and participation. Next is building data sharing capabilities. Unify strategies on uh, ongoing various places. And set up biobank facilities and training of manpower. And building study cohorts. That's all I want to stop at this stage. Now I'll invite Professor Majumda to uh, uh, deliver his talk, and together we can address the questions. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you. So you got an overview of um, what's going on in India in various areas of human genetics, genomic medicine. Um, I just want to add a few sentences to what Mr. Sinha just spoke, uh, which is that um, in, terms of, uh, in, ter in terms of the past, India did not participate in major international collaborative efforts, but more recently, uh, in 2009, India did decide to participate in the International Cancer Genome Consortium. So what I'm going to talk to you about is primarily um, uh, what, uh, what we've been doing in the International Cancer Genome Consortium. So it's probably going to be a little bit more scientific than policy or general general um, discussions. I also wish to mention that uh, there are other agencies aside from the Department of Biotechnology, such as the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, who also partner internationally. And right now, the uh, CSIR, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, they have a major partnership with the Mayo Clinic. Um, on again in areas uh, impinging on human health uh, and 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 genetics. 
So uh, we, um, in India, because there are multiple agencies that fund research, um, it's a little difficult to find all of the information in one place. But all that I'm trying to point out is that aside from uh, Department of Biotechnology, which was the major focus of Mr. Sinha's talk, uh, there are other agencies. He did mention some of them. Uh, the Indian Council of Medical Research um, collaborates prim primarily with the World Health Organization. And let me uh, start with what the um, Indian Council of Medical Research has done uh, over a 20-year period, which is uh, which actually is the background of India's participation in the International Cancer Genome um, Project. So the Cancer Atlas of India, which is primarily, which is primarily an um, epidemiological atlas, uh, was created for, uh, for, two de for a period of uh, spanning two decades, and this was done in collaboration with the WHO. Uh, what this has accomplished is a nationwide uh, epidemiological database, and this goes to not to the village, but a cluster of villages that's called a district um, um, for every every single district of India. And what I'm going to tr try and show you are um, are, are uh, those those graphs um, that pertain to uh, oral cavity because I'm soon going to um, sort of specialize in the oral cavity. So this is uh, these these data sets are done by the ICD codes, ICD-10 codes. So this is cancer of the tongue, and as you can see that. Uh, the, the, these are age-adjusted incident rates per 100,000 population. And uh, as you can see that these data are primarily um, done for every single district of India, uh, clusters of villages. There are certain areas that could not be covered because of political disturbance and other kinds of stuff, but uh, by and large, it's, it's uh, uh, nearly complete. So we uh, have, this is uh, cancer of the mouth. Um, uh, this is uh, cancer of the tonsil, and in particular, I would like to draw your attention to geographical differences even within India. So, for example, cancer of the tonsil is, has a very high uh, incidence and prevalence in, um, in the northeastern region of India. This is cancer of the oropharynx, again, uh, fairly high. Uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma is fairly high in the northeastern region of India. Um, the institutions that are primarily involved in cancer research um, uh, to add to what uh, Mr. Sinha just said, uh, there are other institutions that, uh, that are outside of the uh, Department of Biotechnology who are, into, uh, who are into, uh, clinical and basic research, basic biology of cancers, a number of institutions, and then there are adjunct uh, like technology platform facilities such as uh, so, uh, Center for uh, whatever. <laughs> I can't remember the acronym, but... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, molecular Platform Center for Advanced Molecular Platforms or something it's called. Um, then the, there's the in Institute of Bioinformatics in, uh, in Bangalore um, and, and CDAC in, in Pune, Center for Advanced uh, uh, Computing. Um, then uh, the, the focus of research is primarily uh, are, are several in terms of foci. Some are based on disease burden. So for example, oral and head and neck cancer, about which I'm going to talk to you about. Cervical cancer has a major focus in India, primarily because of its high prevalence. Uh, breast cancer is catching up. In some areas, breast cancer is even more prevalent than cervical cancer. And so there is a lot of um, work that's going on in terms of the in, uh, with respect to breast cancer. Uh, as I said, the northeastern region of India, there's a very high prevalence of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Um, gallbladder cancer, which is almost non-existent uh, in most places of the world, except that along the uh, major river, the uh, river Ganges in, um, in, in India, uh, in the Amazon basin and in the Nile Valley, you do find a lot of gallbladder cancer. And so um, there's, there's uh, an, a unique feature to gallbladder cancer in India. Well, not so unique, but by and large, it's focused in various geographical regions of the world, India being one, and so there's uh, some research that's going on in gallbladder cancer. Gastric cancer, w some of the tribal populations uh, from, the, uh, from one of the northeastern states called Nagaland has a very high prevalence of tribal uh, gastric cancer, and probably this is related to diet um, or the microbiome, so uh, there's some work that's, that's emanating there. This is a difficult region to uh, collect data from, but still some, some institutions are taking major leads in collecting um, information on gastric cancer from there. Um, again, uh, the uh, gliomas um, has a, the center, uh, the uh, Council for Scientific and Industrial Research has a major funding, has a mo major focus on the gliomas. So the Department of Biotechnology usually um, does not fund, fund glioma research because it's funded by the CSIR. All right, so I, I will uh, spend the next few minutes uh, primarily on the International Cancer Genome Consortium and uh, 
Uh, India is participating uh, on, with oral cancer of a specific variety called gingivobuccal oral cancer. And I'll tell you in a moment why we are uh, sp uh, specifically talking about in gingivobuccal oral cancer. The entire project is funded by the Department of Biotechnology, which is under the Ministry of Science and Technology in India. Um, squamous cell carcinoma of the oral cavity is the eighth most common cancer. About 250,000 new cases arise annually. Two-thirds of them are in developing countries, causes about 125,000 deaths annually. It accounts for about a third of all tobacco-related cancers in India. Um, the site distribution of oral cancer is very interesting. In the West, predominantly what, what one finds in terms of the uh, um, cancers of the oral complex is that it's predominantly tongue cancer in the West, and, it's, uh, uh, um, uh, and, and the uh, gingivobuccal complex is about a quarter. Um, in India, three quarters is uh, gingivobuccal complex and only one quarter is tongue. So there is a uh, huge difference in, in, um, in site presentation of uh, oral cancer. The hazardous combination, of course, is tobacco, uh, arica nut, which is a very highly psychoactive substance, um, uh, calcium hydroxide on, on a specific uh, leaf called the beetle leaf, which is uh, widely used. Um, so what we did was to uh, uh, select patients uh, with oral cancer and uh, do exome sequencing on the blood DNA and on the tumor DNA. And um, uh, I obviously don't have the time to describe to you in detail, but these are the genes that, that we found were significantly mutated. Um, some of them are known, known players. Uh, some of these genes uh, were, are not known, to, or at least until... Um, uh, we published our study or conducted our study. These genes were not known to be associated with uh, head and neck cancer, and we found them to be associated with uh, head and neck cancer. And we um, actually, the discovery sample size was 50, and uh, we validated these results in 60 patients. And um, this is these are the these are the genes that are significantly mutated. The pathways uh, uh, that are most significantly mutated are, of course, p53. Um, apoptosis pathway, viral carcinogenesis, about 20% of our oral cancer patients uh, also had HPV infection. But uh, So we looked at the data on, on those patients that had HPV infection, but we didn't find anything, um, uh, uh, anything fascinating or any, any, um, anything that's deviant from the rest of the uh, uh, oral cancer patients. So there was no uh, specific association with HPV. Uh, neurotrophin uh, signaling pathway is a new pathway that seems to be altered in, uh, in uh, gingivobuccal oral cancer and uh, wind signaling pathway. I'm going to skip this slide. It's a, a slightly busy slide. So essentially, this is th these are the genes that are, that are uh, significantly recurrently mutated in oral cancer. These are the genes that where we found um, copy number variations, and this, this is the mutational profile. So you have some patients with very small number of mutations and uh, some with very high number of mutations, and these are the sequence contexts in which the uh, SNVs occur. And uh, if one looks at this closely, we do find um, uh, tobacco signatures in terms of the sequence context where um, SNVs uh, take or these alterations, single nucleotide alterations take place. Um, the copy number variations, those are the genes that are, uh, that f that are recurrently uh, found to have recurrent uh, copy number variations. Um, in uh, GSTT1 is completely deleted in uh, several of our uh, oral cancer patients, and the ones that are partially deleted, genes that are partially deleted, are these genes. We obtained evidence of whole genome duplication in um, seven tumor samples. If you look at patients uh, and, and uh, look at profile these patients or uh, cluster these patients based on the mutational profiles, uh, essentially what we find is that there is one cluster that comprises caspase 8 and FAT1 uh, mutations. Uh, the second cluster, the bigger cluster, comprises P53 mutations, and the third cluster contains uh, um, uh, a variety of uh, genes that are mutated. If you look at disease-free survival, what you see is that there are differences in uh, disease-free survival in these uh, molecular subgroups. If you, um, if one um, looks at uh, patients, one of those subgroups uh, has patients with mutations in MLL4. Although the sample size is small, what we, uh, when we do the Kaplan-Meier, uh, we find that uh, individuals who have the mutation um, survive longer, uh, have disease-free survival of 20 months, while the ones without mutation have a disease-free survival of 13 months. So there is a, a, a seven-month uh, gaining um, of age when, there is, when the MLL4 gene is mutated. Uh, the article has just been published in uh, Nature Communications, and 
Um, the uh, one last point that I want to make with uh, India's participation in the International Cancer Genome Consortium is that we have uh, not only contributed to the effort, the international effort, but um, I and uh, my colleagues in the institute and in the Tata Memorial Hospital, which is the clinical site for uh, clinical collaborative site, uh, we've gained a lot by participating in this international consortium because we have, uh, we've been able to exchange protocols, we've been ex able to exchange methodologies and uh, um, share data and uh, resources. So it's been, um, uh, it's been wonderful participating in this consortium and I do believe that when genomic medicine consortia are um, uh, coalesced through the efforts uh, of, of uh, NHGRI and other uh, international partners, um, India will participate and will stand to gain. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe uh, we have time for one question, which I will ask. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, as you know, uh, one of uh, the fo focal points of what we're trying to do here is also um, is on the implementation side. And uh, I, I didn't see, but maybe it exists, the linkage of the extensive cancer uh, genome uh, cancer sample, cancer genome database to anything that looks like an electronic medical record where you can, you know, know about medication, about treatments, about outcomes, uh, and correlations, uh, potentially, that would be useful for understanding uh, genetic backgrounds that correlate with, with response. Can you comment on that? So, uh, in India, one of the biggest problems is that the largest patient pool uh, is in the government hospitals. That's where the mo vast majority of the patients, irrespective of disease, come in. And that's where uh, electronic medical record keeping is pitiful. So, it's only in the private sector that there is some amount of electronic medical uh, records, but in the government hospitals, virtually none. Uh, the government is waking up to uh, understanding the importance of electronic medical ke record keeping, but it's really non existent. Um, the, uh, the, this research that you're talking about is all in the government hospitals, not in the private hospitals. Uh, which one? The, well, the, 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 the this one? The, the, the cancer, the broad-based uh, cancer uh, genomics program that you have. Is it These are essentially, yeah, so most of them are actually private hospitals, uh -huh. um, and that's where uh, the data are coming from because of the, you know, the quality of the data. Thank you.